Take your Bibles and turn in the book of Ephesians to the third chapter. Book of Ephesians and chapter 3. We've gotten into Paul's prayer that he expresses for the Ephesian church here. It's actually a second prayer that he says he offered for the church. The first one we find back in the first chapter. But this one here, he said in verse 14 that he bent the knee or bow the knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 16 then we get in to the prayer. He said that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. We looked at verse 16 last, when I say last week, I mean, it's actually two or three weeks ago that we looked at verse 16, which began his prayer and he prayed for strengthening of the Ephesian church good prayer to be praying we we all as we pray for one another. We ought to pray for Grace Baptist Church. That he would grant us according to his riches to be strengthened. To be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. <laughs> We need to be strengthened in the inner man. We looked at that thought the last time, the strengthening of the inner man, but in no way completed the thoughts because the thoughts continue on into verse 17, which is where we want to begin today. This, this strengthening results in, in something. This strengthening of the inner man results in, in Christ, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye be rooted and grounded in love. Now, that's a precarious statement of sorts to be making. Isn't it? Given to whom he's talking? That Christ would dwell in their hearts by faith? Does not Christ dwell in the hearts of all of his people by faith? So 
if he's not praying here for their salvation, the Ephesians were already saved. They were already saints. So he was not talking about salvation. Just to reaffirm what you already know or already think you know, turn with me to chapter 1. In verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints, to those which are made holy, they're, they're the saved. They're sanctified. They're set apart unto God. Which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. <laughs> See, he's already saying, you're in Christ Jesus. And we're even faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. See, he says, God is our Father. <laughs> well, we go back several weeks ago and dealt with that thought. God our Father. Not, not the Father of all men, but only the Father of those who are saved, those who are born again. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Listen, that can only be said of those that are that those that are saved, those that are saints, those that are in Christ Jesus. They're the only ones that have spiritual blessings in Christ. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. See, the chosen. <laughs> and it's only the saved who are the chosen. <laughs> that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us. <laughs> you see? <laughs> he predetermined. He determined beforehand my adoption to be children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And go on into chapter 2 and he says, And you hath he quickened. Made alive. Amen. If you remember our study in that, hath he quickened is in italics. It's italicized. So it's added there by the King James translators. For clarification, for our understanding. Didn't do any harm to scriptures, but it, the original read, and you who were Dead in trespasses and sins. The fact that we were dead in trespasses and sins, but no longer are dead in trespasses and sins, presupposes our quickening. Amen. You see? So, and you hath he quickened. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. So it's very obvious he's writing to save folks, and so he can't be praying for their salvation. These saints at Ephesus, they were already sound in, in doctrine as is evidenced through this. Uh, uh, chapters 1 through 3 are called typically of the book of Ephesians are called uh, dealing with doctrine. Which you understand doctrine is simply teaching. Amen. And so all the word of God is doctrine is teaching even that which chapters 4, 5, and 6 is teaching us to be holy and live holy lives and the manner of life that we ought to live. That's a teaching. It's doctrine. 
But these, these saints were already knew the truth. Paul, in, in the first chapter, and, and you think about all the teachings that we looked at there as we were in the first chapter and, and before we continued on with the first, first chapter. Just reiterating with them that which they already knew. Reaffirming that which they already knew. Reassuring them of that which they already knew as we do with you all from time to time. But he was talking here not about salvation, but he was talking about a deeper experience with Christ. We simply would say today, growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he was praying for them, that, that their strengthening would produce in them a, a dramatic growth in the faith. In the faith. Not that they didn't already have faith. They had faith. But it doesn't matter where you're at in your stage of faith there can always be the increasing of that faith. Turn with me to the book of Matthew in chapter 6. The book of Matthew in chapter 6 and verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the, to the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? What does he say next? O oh, ye of little faith. How many times you and I as Christians, we have faith and we say we're trusting Jesus. We're trusting the Lord. But how many times do you and I worry about things? Whatever it may be. You may not worry about food. You may not worry about where your next meal is coming from. That, that, that's a, a substance that is basically foreign to Americans today. Unless you're homeless on the street. may not know where your next meal is coming from. But you and I, I mean, we have food in our cupboards and food in our refrigerator. It may not be what we want at the time that we want something, but we have food there to eat. And most of us have sufficient clothes. may not be as much or just what we would like to have, but we do have clothes. But there are things that we do worry about from time to time. And he says concerning worry, O ye of little faith, O ye of little faith. Chapter 8. <clears throat> Chapter 8 and verse 26.
And you know the record here. Jesus entered into a ship. And he went down into the ship and promptly fell asleep. And lo, and behold, <laughs> there became a strong storm on the seas. And his disciples came to him in verse 25 and said, awoke him saying, Lord, save us. We perish. <laughs> really? They were in the ship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, save us. We perish. <laughs> And he saith unto them, Why are ye so fearful? O ye of little faith. Notice in both instances. He did not say you have no faith. For he's talk, speaking to people of faith. But he said, oh, ye of little faith. How little our faith is. Chapter 16. Chapter 16 and verse 8. Jesus here had warned his disciples to beware of the loving of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And his disciples, thinking, well, he's talking about bread. He said that because we didn't bring no bread with us. Well, they had just been with him at the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. And how many baskets did they take up in each instance? Verse 8, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. <laughs> and that's not what I was talking about at all. He's talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Beware of their doctrine. Beware of their teaching. Their, their, their teaching is as baskets with holes in it. Their, their teaching is, as he likened it in, in Matthew chapter 23, to a whited sepulcher. They've, they, they, they've painted the outside of the sepulcher and made it all pretty and beautiful and inside it was full of bones, dead man's bones. They've made the outside of the cup all clean, but inside the cup is full of dirt. That's what he was warning them against. Not that of bread, but, but, but because they had forgotten about the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000, Jesus says to them, and when, when he knew their thoughts, he says, Oh, ye of little faith. I mean, you've just witnessed the great feeding in my hand and the miracle that I performed. And your reasoning this way? Now? Are we not the same? 
Do not, do not we witness great things at the hand of God? And yet, become fearful and fail to trust Him. The next moment. Turn with me to the book of Luke in chapter 17. <clears throat> this is a great teaching. I'm going to take the time to read the first four verses. I want verse 5. There again, my Bible has a paragraph mark at verse 5. I don't see it a change of paragraph at verse 5. It's, it's continuing. I mean, he says this in response to, to what was before. That's what this is said in response to. Verse 1, Then said he unto the disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Lord, how oft? How often am I to forgive my brother? He keeps doing the same thing. Am I to keep forgiving him? And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. I don't know about you, but that's not in me. I mean, I might be able to bear it on for one or, once or twice. But by the end of that second time, I'm going to be saying, now, if you were really sincere in your, in your apology and your forget, seeking forgiveness, then you wouldn't do it again. Isn't that the way we think? <laughs> the Lord said, keep on forgiving him. Amen. And you know what the apostles realized? They realized that it wasn't in them either. And what did they say? <laughs> Lord, increase our faith. Amen. <laughs> you see, it's only as we are increased in faith and strengthened in faith that we're, we'd be able to do that. Second Peter chapter three. So Peter closes out this writing of his second epistle, saying, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. But grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, need, we all need our faith strengthened. 
We need to grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's as, it's as we grow in, in, in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and see him in a greater way and greater views of him that we're growing in grace. It's the grace of God upon us. And it's a strengthening of our faith. But he leaves us with these words of caution. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I refer to this verse often. So we'll turn there and read it. Let your eyes feast upon it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth. Take heed, lest you fall. <laughs> See, why I said it doesn't matter at what stage you're at in, in, your, in faith. We all have need of a strengthening, a growing of our faith, an increase of our faith. Growing in faith, Paul says in his prayer concerning the Ephesian church, that Christ may, Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye be rooted and grounded in love, you see, a growing in faith, that growing in faith, the increasing of our faith it is the rooting and the grounding of us in love. A rooting and a grounding in love is what enables me to get, forgive my brother seven times in a day. Or more. <laughs> Without it, <laughs> I won't do it. You won't either. Rooted. Strengthened with roots. To render firm. We know a little bit about roots. Anybody that... Uh, as a horticulturist or a gardener knows a little bit about roots and, and depends on, on that plant putting them roots down and, and generally what you see above ground there's that many roots or more below ground to sustain the plant just like you look at these majestic oak trees uh, out here and, and gigantic and beautiful and, and they've got a vast root system out there however root on the oak trees down here in Florida anyhow don't go deep so in a strong wind like the hurricanes they get uprooted <laughs> where the pine tree has a deep tap root that goes deep into the earth <laughs> and they just break off halfway in those strong winds but nonetheless they both have a strong root system that, pro that provides nourishment and strength to that which is above ground. So it's strengthened with roots to render firm. So rooted in love, we're able to stand against any and all storms of evil. Do we love? When one is unlovable, when one whom has offended seven times in a day, and each time has asked for forgiveness, do we continue to love? I've heard people say, well, I love you, brother, but you're offending me. And I'm offended. <laughs> well, what does the Bible say about love? 
True love covereth a multitude of transgressions. Hideth over. Doesn't pay attention to them. Not my problem. I'll seek to help and to strengthen you. But I'm not going to make it my problem. You see. Grounded. Simply means to lay the foundation. To make stable. So, grounded in love. That foundation has already been laid. Christ Jesus. He's our example. And oh, how he loved me. Oh, how he loved you. How did he love me? Well, he loved me when I was unlovable. Yes. I'm still unlovable. <laughs> he loves me still. He loved you when you were unlovable. And you're still unlovable. He loves you still. But God, who commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, enemies at enmity, Christ dying for us. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man will lay down his life. For his friend. He considered me a friend before I was a friend. And he gave his life so that I might become his friend. <laughs> you see. Colossians chapter 2 in verse 7 rooted and built up in him established in the faith as ye have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving <laughs> He said here that rooted, we were rooted and built up in him. We're to love as he loved. We're to forgive as he forgave. First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 13. Oh, you know that chapter, do you? The chapter on love, on charity, verse 13, and now abideth faith, hope, charity. Yeah, I'm speaking to you, charity, and faith, and hope. <laughs> But the greatest of these is charity. <laughs> See? Amen. But there has to be the increase, the, the strengthening of the inner man for us to grow in, in faith, 
to increase our faith that we might be rooted and grounded more in love. <laughs> because that's the greatest. Why? Because it is that charity, it is that love which will cause a man to lay down his life. For a man. Yeah, it'll cause, cause me to turn and walk away from a fight and not to hold anything against you. It'll cause me to come up and, and, and embrace you and hug you and say, I love you, brother. It'll do the same for you. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5 and verse 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision or works, good works, availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. <laughs> But faith, true faith, strong faith, which worketh by love. <laughs> There's the manifestation of our faith. By our love is the manifestation of how much faith we have. By how we love. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Ah, oh, if the Spirit of God is working in us, He's producing in us love. And notice that's the first one listed. Romans 5 5. The love of God is shed abroad in our heart. Shed abroad in our hearts. That love that He has shed abroad in our hearts, that is His love toward us, which reached to the vilest of sinners, is shed abroad in our hearts so that we can reach to the vilest of sinners and love them. Wow. <laughs> Back to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. In verse 8. Who also declare unto us your love in the spirit. Here's talking about a dear fellow servant who declared the Colossians' love, which they had in the spirit. See, agape, charity, love, real love. is there by the Spirit of God. As we already referenced Romans 5.5. 5. Chapter 3. Verse 14. I said, And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Charity is the bond of perfectness. Charity is the cement. That bonds you and I together in perfectness. Did you get that? 
Charity, love, is the cement, it is the bond which binds you and I together in perfectness. You see why he, he admonishes the churches to, to, to be no divisions, to be unity, to be no schisms in the body? Because, because we have the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. But he realizes the weakness and the frailty of the, of the flesh and so he prays for the Ephesian church as he did for all the churches that there would be a strengthening in the inner man. And that faith, there would be a growth in faith, an increase in faith that they might be rooted and grounded in love. For one another. And so, John tells us in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Where is our love? We profess to be in God. We profess to be in Christ Jesus. Where is our love? Is it there? Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. That feareth, uh, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him, because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar, for he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? That's a, good, that's a good question, right? We see one another, we live with one another, we greet one another, we experience one another, and we can't get along, we can't love, but we say we love God and we don't even see God. Only with the eye of faith. God help us. And this command that have we from him, that he who loveth God, love his brother also who is unlovable. <laughs> and I'll be the first to admit that most of the time, at times, and probably maybe even most of the time, I'm unlovable. And at times, you're unlovable. But I'm to love you, and you're to love me. Amen. And love that comes from God is the bond, is the cement that cements us together in perfectness. Shall we stand? Be dismissed in a word of prayer.